Hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming to coming here today to the meetup. Um, yeah, I said um, thanks to Robin, thanks to the meetup. Um, I gave my my uh, lightning talk like about a year ago here, and it was a, a good push for me to to come here again uh, to give this talk. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm uh, Mohammed. I'm a software engineer at HelloFresh. Um, I'm also a co-organizer at BerlinJS. So if you're interested in JavaScript, also check that out. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about testing, about like yeah, automatic automatic testing in React specifically, um, and tips in general. So um, the, the thing uh, that made me get this talk in the first place is I was frustrated because we at HelloFresh we have a, like we have a good test suite, um, like we have a, a big um, a, like a large amount of coverage. But the problem is, a lot of tests are kind of brittle. When um, we, you change something in the code, suddenly you have like ten tests that are failing, even though like that t the thing you, you changed didn't actually like um, change any functionality. Uh, and even if it was like a style change or something that you adding or removing a data test ID or something, um, so that made me think, why is this happening? This is not supposed to be like why we have tests in the first place. Um, that made me think, why um, do we even write tests in the first place? Um, like, I mean, we have to write the tests, we have to maintain them, we have to run them on each pull request, we have to run them, like, run them when deploying, so clearly they do slow us down. So there has to be something that comes from that. Um, and the reason we write tests is usually you write tests to give you more confidence, because um, the point of tests is, is to tell you, like, not that you made changes, because you already know that you made changes. The point of test that to make you to tell you um, if those changes broke something in the in the code that what happened unexpectedly. So tests kind of allow us to refactor our code and giving us the confidence. Okay, like if the tests don't break, then I know that the code didn't break and I know I can deploy this. Um, and if we want developers to like embrace the culture of testing and and like write more tests. We have to show them why in the first place. You don't just go to people and tell them write tests, write tests, and shame them into doing it. Because when you're not there, they're not going to write tests. Or they're just going to write tests that pass the, the, the coverage or whatever metric you set without actually providing any value. So how do you see benefits? How do you see the benefits from tests? Um, there are two ways to see the benefits. Um, you can see benefits when, like, if you refactor some piece of code and you know that it didn't break anything, and you see that the, your test suit did not break, then you know, okay, this test suit is not testing something that um, is not about functionality, it's, it's really focused on functionality. The other part is, if you change something, and you unexpectedly break something, and you find a test that broke, then you know, okay, like you're, you're protected, you, you have a test suit that is covering you from accident breaking. So that gives you more confidence in refactoring your code. Um, so I have a few tips for tests in general, and I think the first thing is the test should serve as um, documentation for how the code works. Um, so you have to think about clear names for your tests and like um, what, what exactly they, they do. Um, you have to be explicit about what you're testing, so you like the test it tests just one thing and you know exactly what it's testing. Um, and also it's a good it's a good thing to avoid like Dry, which is don't repeat yourself in test code. Um, some some people I see like write write code that is just like um, try to make it as reusable as possible in the tests when when you don't really care about that that much because this is you care more about readability. You care more like about um, having a test a test um, case that you see everything in that test case. You don't have to follow around where this is coming from. So that um, and also you're you're not shipping that code to the to production. So the more code is not actually going to hurt you. Um, another thing is each test um, should bring some should bring some unique value and should not be coupled to any other test. So, for example, you can have a test that um, if um, you have a function that subtracts five from a number, and you have a test that tests that it returns a number, and a test that tests that it subtracts five out of ten. Um, if this function does not does not in fact return a number, then the second test will break anyway. So. The first test is, does not bring any unique value. That um, um, so you just can have two two breaking tests, and the only thing that broke is just one thing. So make sure that each test you write actually brings this unique value. 
Um, another thing is tests should be as flexible and as accommodating as possible because you don't want to write tests that break each time each time you make any change to the code, even though even if you change don't change functionality. Um, so you should think hard of like what do you want to test, what parts of the code you're not going to write tests for the whole code. So what parts of the code do you really care about not breaking, and what parts can you be more flexible with? Um, an example from HelloFresh, which is basically we have recipes, we have food, and um, we have a grid of recipes, and one, once we updated a package, and suddenly the last recipe in each row had a little uh, more height than the rest. So we thought, okay, um, we, need, we need to prevent this in the future. We fix, fix it, obviously, but we need to prevent it in the future. How do we, we prevent this? Um, there are two ways to test for this. So the first thing is you can ensure that each recipe card has like the 170 pixels, which is the recipe card height that we have at the moment. Um, so you can ensure that, okay, uh, if all of them are 170 pixels, then this are fine and um, the layout is fine. But um, another thing is you can ensure that both tests have the same height and you don't care about like if it's 170 pixels, if it's 200 pixels. Because this way, you can maybe add some labels or add some button or add something to the layout. And as long as they're all consistent, that's what you really care about. You don't care about the height, you care about consistency. So you can write both tests, but think about what you want to test. Um, another tip is to fix your bugs by writing tests for them first. Um, so the first thing is, like it's, it's, a, it's kind of a framework. You have some bug that someone reported. And what do you do? You find the buggy function, you know, that's easier said than done, of course, but you find where the, the, the function that is not behaving as expected, and then you look at the function, and um, first of all, you call, like you see, okay, this function takes those inputs, and it's not working as expected, it's returning the wrong value. So what do you do? You write the test that, that actually breaks this function that, with those inputs, so you know already this test um, re reproduces that bug. And after that, you can use that test to reproduce the bug, uh, because a in front-end code usually, if you any change in the code, you have to reload the page, and maybe you have to click on a button and go here. So it's a lot of time to trying to fix that bug. When if you isolate the, that part, you already you already did the hard part of isolating it. So you, with that test, it's a lot faster feedback loop. So you can fix that um, a lot faster. Um, so yeah. Um, and then after you fix the bug, you already you have a bonus of already having the test that will prevent this bug in, from happening again. So you fix the bug, it was a faster faster way to fix it, and you're not, not going to have it again. Um, in the way of this talk, um, I, was, like, I was thinking what, what, what is like, a good test to have and what is a bad test to have. So I think there are two ways to tell if like a test is bad or not not providing value. Um, the first thing is if the test broke while the source code or the uh, your application did not actually break, then this test is not actually providing value and it's slowing you. Um, another thing is if your application broke and your test did not break, then this test is also not providing value and it's it's just there for nothing. Um, and another tip is tests should be behavior sensitive and not structure sensitive. So tests should test the, the behavior of your code, the behavior of your application. It shouldn't care about how you're structuring your application, how you structure your code, how you structure your component. Your test should not know about that. Um, that way you can make it as resilient as possible to change the structure of your code while keeping your application intact. So what shouldn't, shouldn't break your tests? You have some tests and you want to know like what shouldn't break them. Um, for example, if you had a data test ID or an ID or something to an, uh, um, some element that doesn't actually change anything in the page, it's just, for example, for end-to-end -end testing, then that also shouldn't change to, to break your test, obviously. Um, if you refactor your code without changing your functionality, it obviously should not break your tests because that's the point of tests. And if you change some styles, um, if you change like the font or something, if you change the color, if you change the paddings, it's really hard to tell like if this is right or wrong. You have to look at it and see, okay, this padding is correct, does it look good or not? So this is like something that you have to manually check anyway. So it doesn't make sense to have an automated test for it for some um, specific fixed value. So um, I have a couple of like tests, or like, um, yeah, tests for the same thing and. 
Um, like in my opinion, one of them is providing more value than the other. So we basically have like a header, and we want to make sure that this header is like when we pass the enabled price drawer, it renders a price drawer. So um, one way we can do it is um, we render the component, and we expect like to like we take a snapshot of whatever is rendered, and that's it. You know, we know, we know that it's rendered. Um, this is basically like the snapshot of the component. This line is the one we care about. Like this, the total container is the one that we care about being in in, uh, in the component. Um, another way to test it is basically you render the component the exact same thing, but instead of just making like a blanket snapshot and knowing okay this is the whole thing that's on the screen, you look exactly for that part, the container that you're looking for, and you make sure that it exists. And this way. If you change anything in the, the rest of the snapshot and the rest of the component, then the test will not break and it will only break if this component is not there, which is what we care about. Um, another thing is, I think snapshots are very overused. Um, I think um, they're, not, like, they're not used well, generally. Um, and my problem with snapshots is they're implicit, so it's really hard to know what, what this is testing. Like, for example, you can have a lot of snapshots that say like this component should render, and then okay, it renders, but you don't know like this it renders a huge snapshot, and you don't know like what part of this is important, what part is not, what part is like if this snapshot changed, um, then I should worry about, and what part is not. Um, the other thing is yeah, um, because they have like a huge um, surface area, um, there's a lot of things that can change in that snapshot, which means that it's gonna break more often than you want them to. Um, they almost always fail like the metric that I just talked about, the bad test test, um, because they usually break when the component doesn't end. They usually don't break if some functionality um, broke. Um, the one thing about snapshots um, that where they can be useful is if you have a design system, for example, or a reusable style component, um, style library, then you want to make sure that each of these components like looks exactly the same because there you actually care about like the colors or whatever you want to make sure that only um, like they look exactly the same because it's it's reusable. So then it makes more sense to okay have a snapshot for this component so we know exactly this is how it looks instead of testing for each property in that reusable component. Um, this is more uh, controversial, but I think um, many of your te unit tests can be replaced by a type system. Um, this is not sponsored by Microsoft, by the way. Um, yeah, so there is this tweet that I really like. Um, it's basically type checking can help you uh, replace a lot of unit tests. It does it a lot better. It, it, it's just specialized for a specific thing. So you can replace it by a unit test, but you have, you're going to have to write a lot of unit tests to replace it, and you're probably not going to do it well. So if you can, just use a type system. Um, this is basically an example. Um, in TypeScript, you can have like a capitalize and add HelloFresh to the end of, of, the, of the string function. Um, and it, this function basically takes a string and adds HelloFresh and uh, capitalizes it. But now if we call this function with a number, the, the compiler would, would error and we're not going to be able to do that. If we call this function without any, any uh, argument, also the compiler would throw an error before even having to look at it in the first place. You're not going to be able to commit that to it. Um, if you have, don't have that and have unit tests instead, you have to check basically if the word is string first, because if you call concat, it's going to break. Um, and also you're going to have to write tests for each, okay, if I call number, does it break? No. If I don't call, uh, call with any arguments, does it break? No. And you're going to have one test that basically tests the actual functionality of the function and a lot of other tests. So again, if you can, use type system because it will uh, help you a lot with these mundane um, tests that you don't have to write. So, um, the other part is 100% coverage uh, is a trap. Um, basically, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, if whenever you have a metric that is like your single source of like if this is good or bad, you can optimize from that metric and it's not going to be a good metric anymore. It's not going to be a metric, it's just going to be a goal. Um, so, even if you have high test coverage, it's not indicator that um, your tests are sufficient. Um, also, focusing on high test coverage leads to like low quality, easy games um, tests, like for example snapshots, because you can just write one test, it will cover the most of what the component does, and that's it, you're going to get the coverage. 
because again, you're incentivizing people to just care about coverage as much as possible, so they're going to look for it. This is a thing that gets there as, as fast as possible. Um, another thing is basically beyond 70 to 80 percent of coverage, you get diminishing returns on um, your test cases because you're going to be more and more specific about what you're testing, and you're going to test for like these specific edge edge cases, um, and you want to cover all the code. Which again, if you have 100 percent test coverage then any change, any change in the code is going to break the test, which is not what you want. You want to have the test suit only breaking for the important changes, or the breaking changes that did, that did actually break its functionality. Um, yeah, so high test coverage means that you're likely more testing implementation details, which basically defeats the purpose of testing the first possible. And it will make also um, harder, not easier for you to refactor your code, because any refactor you make is going to um, break the test. So, um, next thing is, how do you know is, if our test suit is good enough? Um, should we improve it, should we write more tests, what do we do? Um, basically, the good metric that I found was, if you really get bugs into production, um, if like it really happens and usually it's not a problem in the code, maybe like some um, API request fails or something, then you know that maybe you have a test suit that is good enough. Another thing is basically, if you want to refactor your, uh, some component, some file, then you really hesitate, you don't hesitate, you don't think, okay, maybe I'm going to break something, I don't want to touch this code, I don't know. So if you have that fear, then you know that, okay, this, this part is not covered and you want to, to improve your test suit. So these two metrics, to me, are a good indicator. Again, there's, it's not one single metric, it's subjective, but it's a lot better than just having one metric like, said, like test coverage and that's it. Um, yeah, I just had to include a GIF um, because yeah, uh, basically this is what happens when like tests pass while you know production are uh, is failing. So yeah. So another part uh, I want to talk about is black box testing, which is basically testing like your code, your components from the point of view of the users. Um, you don't know like you're testing it without knowing the without the test knowing anything about um, how the code is written. Um, and in case of React, um, React components usually have two users. You have first the user that is actually using your application, like the end user. And you also have the developer user who is using the component that you're writing in their code. So you get the component, you pass the props, so you know like this is how they use it. Um, how do we do black box testing in UI? Um, for example, you can click on a button and then this is from the endpoint user perspective. You click on a button, you expect something to happen on the screen, so that you don't know exactly what this button does under under the hood. But you do that from the point of view. Um, another thing, for example, from the developer user perspective, is passing different props to the component and see what does it render, um, and what what changes on the on the screen. So again, you don't know what what it does in the component, but you're just changing the public API. So. Yeah, instead of testing like the, the components specific methods, component state, um, any internal methods, you're testing what the component actually shows to you. So um, I have an example. We have a very simple um, counter that has state count and has an increment method and has a button. The button calls increment when you click on it, and we have uh, just we're showing the, the count on the screen whenever you know, like uh, the state changes. So. One way to, ch um, to check for this is basically you can um, call the increment method in the test. You call the increment method. Uh, first of all, you check that the count is zero, and then you call the increment method, and then you check the state and see if it's zero, if it's one. Um, that is a test, um, but um, this is not what we want. We don't want to know what the, the state does. We don't want to know um, the exact methods because if you name the function increment, this test is going to break. If you change like where it's called, where like uh, if you make it inline, for example, also the code will break. Um, another way we can do it is basically we have um, we find the button on the on the rendered uh, on the rendered screen, and then we click on the button, and then we see the text of the count, and we check okay if it's one, then that's it's good. This this does actually increment. If it's not, then that's, this test will break. Um, we don't know what how this works under the hood, but we know that this is what we care about as an end user. Um, a better yet thing is um, to add use instead of just finding the first button that you have and clicking on it, 
Um, usually it's better to have like a data dust ID or something that um, specific, specifically for the thing that you're clicking. Um, because, for example, if we think maybe we want to add a, a decrement I, uh, button, uh, uh, and if we add that, then basically that test will break because it will click on the first button which decrements, which you know is not what we want. So we can just add a data test ID, we look for this specific thing, and it's also going to be more explicit because you're looking exactly for the increment button, you're just not just looking for a button and that's it. Um, so that's basically how we do it and how we make it more explicit. Um, how do we know if we're testing implementation details in our tests? Um, so basically a good rule of thumb is to imagine that you did not, you do not know how this code is written, you do not have access to the code of the component or whatever you're, you're um, testing, um, would you be able to write the test that you're writing right now or not? If you wouldn't be able to write it, then you know that you're testing something that only like, the person who wrote or can see the, the code um, um, can write the test. If not, if, if you can write the test without knowing the source code, then it's a good, it's a good thing that you're not actually testing the implementation details. Um, another part is unit, um, the types of tests that you can write. So we have unit tests, we have integration tests, we have end-to-end -end tests. What's the difference? Why, what, what should I use, etc. So, first of all, how do you know if the test that you wrote is like, what kind of test did I just write? Is it a unit test? Is it an integration test? What do I do? Um, so, if you mock everything that your unit is using, then it's basically a unit test. If you're just testing the exact unit and you're mocking all the inputs, all um, the API calls, everything that it uses, then this is a unit test. Um, if you mock nothing, nothing at all, you're just <coughs> rendering a page and clicking something and expecting something, then this is an end-to-end -end test because you did not, you did, everything is working exactly as you have in production or whatever. Um, you're testing it. Everything in between is basically an integration test. Um, if you mock one thing, then it's an integration test because like, you're integrating um, the rest of the things that you didn't mock with this unit. If you, do, like, uh, if you mock everything but one thing, you're still integrating with that one thing. So basically, unit tests are, are tests that, you know, um, for example, will always run, will always um, behave exactly the same, um, no matter what. They don't do any database calls. They don't do any network requests. They don't do any file system access. They don't produce like different results based on the date or the time that you have. So all these basically make you just not unit test anymore. But what is the difference? Why should I write the unit test? Why should I write uh, integration test? Why should I write any of these? Like um, any one of these things. Um, so there are trade-offs. Um, first trade-off is points of potential failure. Um, usually, the more um, specific you go with your test, the more like the less points of failure that this test is going to break. Um, if you're testing one very small unit, then you know that if this test broke, then it's just this unit. If you have a one end, big end-to-end test that is testing an entire future, then you know anything in this future is gonna, can break and is going to break this test. So that's a trade-off you have to make. Um, another thing is engineering time, because usually it takes a lot more time to write an effective, um, good like end-to-end -end, end -end or integration test um, than just writing one unit test for one um, small unit. So again, that is something that you have to keep in mind. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have the amount of code tested. So the more higher level you go, the more amount of code you test in one test at a time, um, so that you can save a lot of time and also you, like you with one test you can cover all, like a whole future for example with, which you would have to write a lot of unit tests for otherwise. Um, another thing is confidence because um, the higher level you go the more confidence that this is you, you know that this is working like this you're testing how it's used um, by the users um, because users don't care about your counter function or your um, um, any util that you write, they don't care about that. They care about the whole website. They care about the whole features. So the higher level you write, the higher, uh, the more confidence that you have, and also the less likely you, you're going to be testing any implementation details because in one end-to-end -end test you're not going to be able to like write very specific implementation detail um, um, specifics. While in a unit test you're more tempted to look at the unit that you're testing and basically test each line. So with a uh, higher level you're not going to be able to do that. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Testing implementation details with a higher level, you don't do that. Um, another GIF, because you, know, you have to do that. Um, so this is basically two unit tests, zero integration tests. Each window works on its own, but when you put them together, tough luck. 
So, um, we have some tools that we can use for tests. Um, for example, we have something like Cypress or Selenium, which can be used more like as integration or end-to-end, -end, depending on if you mod something. Um, they do run in a real browser, so this is basically how users are using your application. Um, and then you can still mock the API responses or the backend, but you're not going to be able to do much in the front-end code, so um, that is more high-level, more end-to-end. Um, um, -end um, and then we have JGest or Enzyme and React Testing Library, which um, usually you write more like unit or end-to-end -end tests. They run in an emulated browser, so not a real browser, not in Chrome, but in something similar. Um, you can still mock everything with it, um, so that's usually why it's more um, more related to yeah, unit testing or smaller um, amounts of testing. Um, so we have the testing pyramid um, that is like a very uh, old um, like um, guideline for tests. Usually, you say like you write a lot of unit tests and you add a little bit of uh, intuition tests and even less um, end-to-end -end tests, and then there's manual testing in the uh, in the top. Um, what I like a lot more um, is this testing trophy, um, which is basically um, you have like a static uh, type system that takes care of a lot of the, te the cheap tests that you would write, and then you have some unit tests, and the majority would be integration tests because this would bring you basically the most bang for your buck because you're testing a lot of things at the same time, and then in the end you also add a couple of unit end-to-end uh, -end tests for your most important um, features, uh, testing them all together. So, um, summary. First of all, um, prefer explicit tests um, than implicit tests because um, this is, is this is you know exactly what what this test is for, and also can serve as documentation. Um, so also avoid snapshots because um, you don't know exactly what 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 part of the snapshot is actually the most important part. Um, also use tests to fix the bugs that you find, since you're gonna fix them anyway, and this is gonna be a, a blanket to save you from um, this bug happening again or any regression. Um, use test coverage as a guide. It's, it can be a useful guide to know what, which parts of the code are you need more uh, attention, but don't use it as a goal because um, people are going to be optimizing for it and you're going to lose the point. Um, prefer integration test to, to get the most um, confidence and um, uh, value for your test because one test can uh, cover a lot more. Um, and uh, you gonna mock like if you mock as few things as possible, then you know that most of these things are working because you didn't mock them and um, you're testing all of them. Um, write tests that mimic the real world usage of your application um, and avoid testing the specific parts of your application that the user does not know about or does not care about. Um, basically, black box testing. And. In the end, use type system if you can. It's not always possible. Um, integration with some other frameworks, some of the libraries that you may use might not be great. So it's um, you can you have to evaluate that on your own. But as a guideline, it's it's a good thing to have to um, cover you from a lot of you a lot of tests that you're gonna have to write otherwise. And that is basically it. Thank you very much.